Amen. Well, let's pray before we start today and just prepare our hearts to receive what the Lord has for us. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the preaching of your word. We thank you for that your word, it speaks life, Lord. It speaks destiny. It speaks purpose. It speaks promise. And today, Lord, we, we come to receive from your word what, you, what the Spirit has to say to your church today. We open our, the ears of our hearts, Lord, to give us, give us a spirit of revelation and wisdom and open our eyes to, to be enlightened to your word today. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to be, we're starting um, week three of our encounter series about, about, about today. We're, talk, we're going to be talking about drawing near to God, drawing near to God. We've been talking about this concept and this, and this thought that's based upon a particular scripture that Paul wrote. And this thought was we, this, is we need God's power more than we need persuasive words. We need God's power more than we need persuasive words. We need to experience God. We just don't need to just only only know about him, but we need to know, experience who he is and have an encounter with him, a very real encounter with him in our lives. God has to be somebody more than that we know about, that we read about, but, but somebody that we've got to yearn to see move in our lives and move in our family's lives and, and touch the people that God has surrounded us with every single day. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 3 through 5, Paul, see, Paul was an educated man. Paul could have, could have very well preached with very persuasive words. He knew scripture. He was, he was, he was tutored. He was mentored by the, the greatest scholars of the time. But he said this to the church of Corinth. He said, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. In my speech and in my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit in, of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. You see, God never intended us for, for us just to talk about, about, about other people's experience or even talk about just, just the facts about, about what the Bible says. But it, God intended for us to experience who he is for ourselves. And it's important for every believer to have your own experience an encounter with God. This includes salvation, but it goes beyond just salvation. Our initial encounter with God is when we become saved and when we, when we, when we, we have a revelation of who he is and what he's done on the cross. In the Bible, God reveals himself through encounters with people, with people that, 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 that God shows himself to, and God uses these people. With Moses, he showed himself through the burning bush. With David, it was in, during times of intimate worship. With, with the priests, where they were ministering before God, and, and, the room, and, the, and God's presence came in the room, and they could not minister anymore. For Paul, was on, like we talked about last week, was on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared. And his life was changed forever. One encounter with God is going to change your life. One encounter with God will change your life. For Peter in the early church, it happened in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Where they gathered and prayed and the, and the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. And what appeared on them were, were clothes of fire on their head. They began speaking other tongues. And Peter was emboldened because of this encounter that he had with the power of the Holy Spirit and went out. And that day, he preached and 3,000 people were saved and baptized. And the church grew. One encounter with God will change your life. Instead, we, we, we find ourselves reading about these encounters and, 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 and listening to other people's stories. But we need an encounter with God for ourselves. In Jeremiah 29, it says this. And this is a scripture that we should all remember when it comes to seeking God and, and, and developing a relationship with him. It says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me. And you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. 
when you search for him with all of your heart, he's going to reveal himself to you. When you develop, when you have this hunger and thirst inside of you for more of God, for, for more of his glory, more of his presence in your life, he's going he's gonna to reveal himself to you. God is waiting for people. People who will draw near to him. The Bible says if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. You see, he's already done everything he needs to do. He's already taken the initiative, and he set it up in a way that his, his presence and his glory and his power is, is accessible by us. But he's waiting for us to take that step towards him. And when we take that step towards him, he takes a big, giant step towards us. But he's waiting for us. You see, God will not push himself on anyone. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he's waiting for us to take those steps of initiative to go deeper in our relationship with him, to go places in our relationship with God that we've never been to, to, be, to, to enter into a revelation of who God is like we've never known before. But it starts with a step. And sometimes those steps are uncomfortable. Sometimes those steps cause us to stretch and to grow. And this is what this series is all about for this next month. Uh, we're going to study about the, encounter, the encounters that people had. And we're going to be continue to go through this next week as well about encounters that people had with God and how they changed their life and how we can have an encounter with God for ourselves. Moses had an encounter with God, and it changed his life forever. And to give you a little bit of background story about Moses, Moses, he was an Israelite. And the Israelite people, they were, they were living in Egypt. Joseph had, had, had his, long story short, had his brothers come to Egypt to rescue them from a, from a famine. And the, and the children of Israel lived in Egypt at the time. They stayed there, and they had offspring, and they began to grow. Their families began to grow. There came a time, though, when Joseph and all the people in that generation had died, and they didn't appreciate the children of Israel in the same way. The king of the time saw the children of Israel in Egypt and said, You know what? They're growing too strong. They're growing in population. They're, they're populating. They're, they're, they, they just might take us over. We've got to do something about this. So they sent taskmasters down there, and they put them into slavery for 400 years. But the more they persecuted them, the more they grew in might and power and population. But these were God's chosen people. They went there to afflict them and afflict them even more. And the more they afflicted them, the more God multiplied them, the more they became more powerful. But, but they made their lives hard and they brought them into slavery. The king of Egypt sent out a decree that these people are becoming too, too strong and mighty. But, but, but he, and he, he told the midwives, he said, you know what, for the Israelite ladies, if there's a young boy that's born, I want you to kill him. The Bible says that the midwives are God-fearing ladies. They, they, they fear God, and they refuse to do so. So Pharaoh dealt with these midwives and put out another, dec another decree that said, for any, any young boy that is born from this point on, he must die. So Moses' mother gave birth to him and hid him for three months. And finding out that he couldn't be hidden any longer, she, she built him a little, a little cradle, a little floating boat just for Moses and put him in the river. And baby Moses floated over to where the son of the daughter of Pharaoh was, and she saw baby Moses and took him out of the water. In long story short, Moses was raised in the king of Pharaoh. Actually, Moses means drawn out of the water. That's how he got his name. But he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, and he became one of them, part of their family. And knowing his heritage, knowing his background, one day he saw a Hebrew person, an Israelite, fellow Israelite, being mistreated by an Egyptian. And, and he was so angered, and he thought he was going to be a hero that day. And he went and he killed an Egyptian 
to defend that fellow Israelite. And because of that, he was, he was, he was, a, he was a fugitive, and he, he became wanted, and the, and the king was very upset. So he, he, ran, to, he ran to Midian, to the, the backside of the desert, where he married, and he became a shepherd. To the priest, for the priest of Midian, and there Moses was for 40 years. I wonder if God placed Egypt in the, Moses in Egypt very similarly like Joseph did. Put him there to deliver his people. I wonder if Moses had missed it, but God had a plan B. He had killed this person, became a fugitive. He had to escape. He might have thought that he had messed it up. He might have thought that, that he, might have, he might have blown God's plan for his life. So here he is, 40 years, probably thinking to himself, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more to this life than where I am right now. He's had to have been feeling this is not my true purpose. He's got, he had to have been feeling this is not what, what God intended for me. This doesn't seem like my, where God has, has wanted me to go. This doesn't seem like the destiny that, that God has for me. His life was in a mundane, probably felt like he missed it. And we pick it up in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Where it says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, see, when you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take off your, take off your sin, take the sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. God says, don't come any closer until you've taken the sandals off your feet. In those days, taking your, taking your feet off was like, was, was, was like a sign of respect when you worship God. Much like taking off your hat. It was a sign of reverence. Uh, uh, in, in a, you're not going to approach God's presence casually. God was saying, you've got to understand before you approach me that you are, you're, you're approaching my holiness, a, a holy God. What's about to happen here is going to change your life forever. You see, you'll never forget when, God, when you have an encounter with God. It's a moment that will change your life forever. And this moment marked his life. It launched him into his destiny. See, if Moses had not turned aside, his life would have gone on. What would have happened if Moses never turned aside? I wonder if for believers, if we're too focused on my plans, my job, my goals, my schedule, my routine, what's best for my family, if we're missing out on what God really wants to do in and through our lives. Because it's not on our path. Moses was willing to look aside, to see what God is doing, and move towards that. And I believe that God is calling some of us, and God is calling us to, to step aside, to look aside, get out of the routine that we're stuck in, the rut that we're in, and turn aside and be involved in what God is doing. See, Moses' life was, was, was marked by continual steps towards God. That's why God used him. God, Moses was on a passionate pursuit for the presence of God. 
Moses went up to Mount Sinai, and when he came down, he experienced God's presence in such power that they had to put a veil over his face because his, his, his face shone with the glory of God. He had experienced God once again with great power and presence. And when we experience God, our life will never be the same. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And God is calling us to draw near to him. Take those steps to draw closer and closer to him. You see, God is always looking for people who will make themselves available. And I believe that God wants to draw near to you this morning. But you know what he's doing? He's just waiting for you. He's waiting for you. And if you're waiting for God to make the, move, the first move, he's already taken the initiative, and he's waiting for you to take those steps closer to him. When you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you because you know what? God responds to our hunger. He responds to the hunger and the thirst that's deep inside of our hearts. And unfortunately, many Christians are led to believe that a relationship, our relationship with God begins and ends at the salvation experience. That's not where it ends. That's where it begins. God doesn't save us to sit there and wait for his return. He not only rescued us from the judgment to come, but he, saw, but he saved us to a relationship with him. To use us and do his work here on the earth. And see, like, like God wants to use Mo, like, like Moses, God wants to use you and wants you to encounter him in a powerful way. Are you with me here this morning? Hallelujah. He wants to flood your life with his power and his presence. Let me say that again. He wants to flood your life with his power and his presence. Why? To do the work of God. He desires every single one of us to be a functioning part of his body and to do it, and to do it, with, to, and to do it with effectiveness and with power. You see, everybody should be doing the work of God. I mean, the, the reason why so many churches in the United States are struggling is because the body of Christ is not engaged and not moving forward in its full potential with only a few that will stick out their neck and do something. 20% do, the statistics say 20% of the people serve and give 80% of the serving and giving. Because only a few are willing to stick out their neck to be a part of what God is doing. It's consumer Christianity. We hear, we hear a message, we drop something in the bucket, then, we, then, then we, maybe we'll show up next week. But God wants more than that from us. He wants a deep, intimate relationship with us. He wants us to encounter his presence and, and, and not forget about him during the week, but pursue him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And when we come to the house of the Lord, we, when we come to church, when we come to church on Sunday morning, We're experiencing his presence and power in a, in a, in a different way because there, there's people all over the sanctuary who have experienced him during the week and we're coming together and we're experiencing him in power. See, one encounter with God will change everything. And this is a thought I want you to remember. That God wants to work in you so he can work through you. God wants to do a work in you so he can work through you. He wants to flood your life with his power and his presence. He wants to do a work so deep inside of you that he can use you to do his work, to use you. God wants to work in you so he can work through you. The Bible talks about two floods that happen in your life, two things that happen, two different floods that happen in your life. He says this, he says, he says this in John 4, water I shall give him shall be like fountains of rivers, living water that will spring up to eternal life. That's talking about salvation. 
But then he goes on to say in John chapter 7, he says this. But he who believes in me, as scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Initially, the fountain is talking about salvation. And then the river, he's talking about the the encounter, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that floods our life with his power and his presence. The day your fountain becomes a river is the day the devil wishes he didn't wake up. (laughs) The day your fountain becomes a river is the day the devil wishes that he didn't wake up. God wants to flood the banks of your life with his power and presence in such a way that that it brings devastation to the camp of the enemy. Not like a stream, but like the Mississippi River. I believe that God wants to flood this city with his love and with his power. From every crack house to every attic to every prostitute, the city hall, into every neighborhood. People experience the power and the presence of Jesus Christ and their lives are being saved. And some of us think, well, imagine if God moved in this time like he did back in the book of Acts. Wouldn't that be awesome? The thing is that God is still moving like that. And if we're not seeing God move like that, it's because we're not moving with him. The the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible also says that he changes not. God is still working. God still is changing lives. God is still doing miracles in people's lives. You see, the people in the early church were no different than us. And we read about them. We read about their experience with God and the encounters they had with God. There are people just like you and I who are all in. Who are all in the relationship with God. Who purpose in their heart to seek first the kingdom of God. Who purpose in their heart to to live their lives fully for God. James 4, 8 again. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not just hearers, deceiving yourselves. You know, many people come to church to receive, and that's great, and we should come to church to receive, but it's got to move beyond that. We've got to be, we've, we've got, and many times we forget to go out there and to do. We come to receive, but we forget to go out there and do. There's an inflow, but there's not an outflow. The Dead Sea is the way that it is in the Middle East because it has an inflow but no outflow. There's always water going in, water going in, water going in. Because of that, things don't grow around it. Life does not flourish inside of that sea. Living water is moving water, water that goes in and comes out and brings refreshment. Water that goes in one direction and stays becomes stagnant and stale. May we have the living water of Jesus Christ flowing in and through our lives, touching the people, touching the city, touching our community. The only miracle that we see should not be for us to show up to church on time. It should be seeing people's lives being changed for the glory of God. I'm praying that this church so floods these streets and this community with the power to love with Jesus. My desire, my prayer is to see God move so powerfully in this place and through the people of Church 180. That we see the power and the presence of God flood this community and this this neighborhood and and, and this city and this region with with the the presence and love of Jesus Christ in such a way that we we see great miracles happen. We we don't just see things happen here inside of the church, but we see things like the crack house at the end of the street shut down. We see addicts delivered. We see the, the alcoholic set free of alcoholism. We see the hurt healed. We see the sick healed. We see miracles happen in people's lives. We see the the hopeless find hope in Jesus Christ. But too many of us were waiting for somebody else to do it. 
We're, we're looking and we're reading upon all the things that somebody else did or what they're experiencing. We're, we're, we watch and we hear stories about how God is using other people and how God is touching somebody else and how somebody else is experiencing God in a very real way. But we don't realize if that we'll come to God and we'll cry out to him. We become thirsty. God will touch our lives too. God wants to touch your life. And he wants to empower you to do the work he's called you to do. Empower you in a way where you resist the lukewarm Christianity. You empower you in such a way that you don't settle for status quo. Empower you in such a way that he infuses you with his boldness and his power to, to continue his work here on the earth. But we've got to be hungry. We've got to be willing to say, God, have your way with me. I give all of me to you. I give all of me to you. It's a continual surrender. It's a continual surrender to him. It's not a one-time surrender when we made a decision for Jesus Christ in our seat at a church or at an altar. But the Christian life is a continual surrender. And the more we surrender to him, the more we experience his power working through our lives. God, I need you more than I need my next breath. I need your presence in my life more than I need my next breath. Like the Bible says, as a deer pants forth the water, so my soul longs for you. we got to come to a place where we're hungry and thirsting and desperation for the power and the presence of God in our life. And if we'll come to that place and we'll come to God with, with that, that hunger and that thirst, he's going to fill you up and you'll experience him like you've never experienced him before. I can remember the day when he filled me. and My life has never been the same. The Bible talks about this experience five times in the book of Acts. An encounter where the apostles asked believers, have you received since you believed? It's an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's what God wants for many of us here today. That's what God wants for us in our lives today is an encounter, a very real encounter with God. He'll come and he'll flood our soul with his power and his presence and he'll, and he'll change our life in a very real way. And the fire of God will come upon our life and, and purify us and burn out all the useless things in our lives or, and, and, and everything that's holding us back in our relationship with God and give us the boldness to do the work that he's called us to do. You know, the band come up. God wants to do a work in you so he can do a work through you. Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13 says, Then you will call upon me, and you will pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for encounters, Lord, that change our life. We thank you, Lord, for the times that we have in your presence, Lord, that draw us closer to you, that draws closer to who you are, that conform us into your image. And today, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you instill within every individual here a hunger and a thirst for more of you. That we would just not be settled for where we are, Lord, but we'd be pursuing your presence. We'd be pursuing your presence and your power in our own life. Where we say, Lord, we give ourselves to you. We surrender all of ourselves to you today, Lord. Can we just stand and worship him? Him, and I want you to stretch out your arms. I want you to cry out, Lord, I want more of you today. I want more of you today, Lord. I'm hungry for you. I'm desperate for you, Lord.
I'm crying out for a touch from heaven on my life. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I feel weak and worn out, but Lord, empower me by your, the power of your presence. Come on, let's worship him. Let's worship him. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you. We're pressing in, Lord. We want more of you in our lives. Lord, empower us. Enable us, Lord. We need a fresh touch of your power in our lives. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, he dwells in us and he will quicken our mortal bodies. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord, we worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you. Come on, let's worship him. Let's worship him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. Let's seek him with all of our hearts today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, we worship you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Come on, let's press in. Let's press in. Let's press in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for meeting us in this place. We thank you for touching hearts and touching lives. And today, as we leave this place, Lord, may we walk into encounters with you this week. Lord, in our prayer time, in the time alone with you, Lord, may we encounter your presence in a very powerful and a real way. Father, we thank you for to ministering to hearts and ministering to lives. And we thank you for the power of your presence that changes us and empowers us, that enables us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.